Hello, welcome to the portion today. Um, we just want to welcome you. And if you remember, I've been here for the last two weeks. So this is kind of my third week um, with Deborah, of course. And so we're both kind of filling in for Dr. Deb and Misty. So they are both, I believe, at different conferences. There's two conferences. Um, Deborah reminded me that there were two conferences this week. So anyway, thank you for joining us. Hello. Yeah. Hey, hey, guys. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited to be here. We um, like like uh, Stephanie said, we're, you know, we've not done this together before. So we're going to um, we're going to kind of we're going to ping pong it back and forth. Mm -hmm. I'm going to start out uh, today and we are looking at uh, Haye Sarah, the life of Sarah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um Genesis 23, 1 through 26, 18. And we've, we've got a few focus points that we're going to look at specifically. I'm, I'm so excited. I'm like, I'm like vibrating with energy because I'm so <laughs> excited about doing this because this is such a fantastic portion. It so I'm is. so, and I'm so tickled that you guys are here uh, with us today. Um, so let's just start off really quickly. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to say one quick prayer just to kind of sure. uh, pull us all together uh, for, um, for unity's sake. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we just ask you, we just ask you to be with all of us ladies right now and that you would, um, that you would move us in that place of echad, move us into this place of unity. And we ask that you would uh, shut down and move away anything that's going to distract from this in all of our minds and all of our hearts and in all of us. We want to love you with all our hearts, souls, minds, and strengths with, with what we're doing right now. And so we ask that you allow us to achieve that. In the name of Yeshua, Amen, Amen. Okay, so, um, this is just going into it. I was talking to uh, Robin earlier this week, and she was asking me. She said, "Are you still going to be on to to do uh, the tour portion with Stephanie?" And I and we were texting back and forth, and and I said, "Yes, I'm so excited. This portion is vibrating with revelation. Mm. It's it's got tops and shadows, scripture connections, and." personal admonition in this that just as I've studied um, this week, it it's just come alive for me. I already w had been doing a study on a word that I had come and found in this portion because I'm doing a, a teaching on on this word because it's first mentioned here in this portion. And so I had I went back and found those notes and I'd, I'd already been swimming there. And so it was like God had already prepared a lot of this like a year ago when I started doing this study. So he's so sneaky like that in their lives mm -hmm. <laughs> that it just tickles me. So I want to love that you use the word swimming there because I always connect the study of scripture, like swimming in the ocean and you can either snorkel or you can yes. put on that wetsuit and do a deep dive. Oh, so yeah. I like that, that phrase that you, you you're using. Well, and I, and we are, we're in the deep end. We're in, this is, this is one of those tour portions that is the deep end. And mm -hmm. so uh, diving deep can be a little bit, you kind of, you can kind of get overwhelmed sometimes by, you know, by doing a lot of deep dives. But if we're together, you know, when you get a bunch of women together, it's more fun. It's like swimming in, swimming in, swimming in the deep end of any ocean or pool. When you got a couple of friends with you, it's not quite so intimidating, right? right. So that's the best way to dive into the deep end of the pool. Yes. I'm with you on that. Yeah. So my, my main focus, what I, what I kept, um, swimming in, uh, is going to be on chapter 24. Um, the whispers, uh, in chapter 24 of a, um, providing father, uh, the waiting groom, his son, and a serving, seeking Holy spirit mm -hmm. and a readied bride. And, uh, when we when we read the the scripture when we when we when we come through it today um what i want us to have in the back of our minds are these are these pictures these types and shadows that we're going to find here mm -hmm. because the whole family the whole family shows up in this tour portion father son holy spirit bride and okay. so it can speak to us in in powerful ways because we're part of this family mm -hmm. so we got to figure out how we, you know, relationships in the family are, are things that we're always needing to, um, to understand. So that's what we're going to look at today. Um, Man. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to, if we start, if we start out looking at it from the, 
from the get-go. Life of Sarah, that's an odd name mm-hmm. for this. Because mm-hmm. right out of the gate, right, uh, she dies. Right? The first chapter is about her burial ground and the purchase agreement mm-hmm. for that burial ground. She lived 100 and, 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And that's pretty much the blurb that she gets. And then mm-hmm. it goes right into um, discussing the purchase of the of the land, the cave of Machpelah, which is um, cave of Machpelah means dub, it's doubled. That's what it means in Hebrew. And sometimes people say, well, that's because there were, it's like a double cave. It's like there's two chambers in the cave. Mm-hmm. And it's also referred to as double because you know how the Lord likes to do things. There's never only one answer. There's always like, well, yes. And also if you right. study with Halisa, it's like, well, yes. And yes. And also it can be Machpelah can mean doubled because it's known as the cave of the couples. Tradition mm. says this is where Adam and Eve were buried. Mm. So um, Adam and Eve, Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca are all buried in this tomb. Now we know Rachel's tomb. Um, she was, she died uh, giving birth to Benjamin. Um, and she was, uh, there is a uh, Rachel's tomb is n- located near Bethlehem. So she's not in the cave of Machpelah, but you've got these three couples that are there. Mm-hmm. Um, so and that's, isn't it right there? It's, you know, It's in the promised land that God had promised Abraham. And so as the Israelites are coming back in, they see and know what this whole area is. And yeah, yeah, it's part of the promised land. So I thought that was interesting that he already was the first to buy property in the promised land that God had already promised and given him. So Yeah, the first plot, first plot bought, and they say around 1677 BC. So you know, and and the and the the intricacies of the way they did this purchase agreement is um, there's a commentary. Uh, Albert Barnes says that that this is the the Eastern understanding, the way it's all set up. Um, this mode of dealing was just that genuine goodwill, the offering, and the you know there's the, there is there's that Middle Eastern way of dealing, and why it's included in this in the scripture is beyond me. I I couldn't I didn't really. I've read it. I've read it a a million times and I just don't really understand why. I'm like, maybe they put that in there for the guys. (laughs) You know what I'm saying? (laughs) Because it's like, it just doesn't speak to me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, why are we focusing on this? But you know, there's got to be a reason it's in there. So, (laughs) sorry. Like I I told you beforehand, even for me, the word that I got for this whole portion is humility. And I think that we see Abraham's humility in this portion in, in chapter 23. And then we're going to see, you know, each person that comes up, we're going to see their humility in the story. Um, So I kind of see that running as a theme through here as well, which, you know, which kind of plays on what what you saw as well, because in order to be in God's kingdom, you know, when when a man and a a wife, a husband and wife come together, there's got to be a certain level of humility, right? to get along there's got to be there's got to be some give and take so we have to kind of put our pride down and serve be servants amen yes well speaking of servants <laughs> abram's abraham's servants right after we go right after we go mm-hmm. from that into 24 abraham's servant is sent laden with gifts to haran to find a wife for isaac so tradition says that this first, you know, this first chapter that we just read, that this is separated from this trip to go find the bride of, by three years, mm-hmm. that there's a three year gap there. Sarah dies. And then three years later, Abraham's servant is sit. Um, and so that's where we open up with Genesis 24. Mm-hmm. So we find Abraham who's old. And he's going to say to the oldest servant of his ha- house, and I'm, I'm in Genesis 24, um, you know, put your hand under my thigh and, and swear that you're going to go and and uh, and find this bride. And he says in chapter four, you go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son, Isaac. And then so the servants, you know, the, and it's, it's always referring to this as the servant doesn't give the name. Right. The servant saying, you know, maybe she won't come back with me. And Abraham says, uh, my son doesn't need to go back to that land. And then he says in verse seven, the Lord God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family and who spoke to me and swore to me saying, so he's going to quote what the Lord has said to him to your descendants. I give this land. 
He quotes him, he's going to send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son from there. So he's proclaiming, this is what's going to happen. Abraham in this faith and in this knowledge, I mean, he's moved into this place of knowing. Um, last week's tour portion that you um, that you studied together, um, that one is where you have this binding of Isaac. And, and this is the picture of the Messiah and some profound things happen there. And so he's, Abraham has moved into this place where, uh, you know, he is walking in a faith that is, still humble, but profound. And so, um, he goes ahead and they say the, um, they do the, he puts his hand under the thigh and they make the oath. And then, um, he, uh, gets on 10 camels. He takes 10 camels and he leaves, uh, to go to Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia to go find this bride. So, um, there's a, there's a wide held understanding. I've got an example commentary here from the believer's Bible commentary regarding Genesis 24, 10 through 14. The servant is a type of, or a symbol of the Holy spirit mm -hmm. sent by the father to win the bride for the heavenly Isaac, which is the Lord Jesus, Yeshua. So the narrative is going to record the preparation for the journey and the gifts carried by the servants and the sign by which he would know the Lord's chosen woman. And that's what I want us to look at here because that's what the Lord kept speaking to me about is it, there is a bride and she is us. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, she is us as in uh, some of the believers that are the overcomers. Some of those are the guests at, at the, at the wedding feast. Some of the the believers are the bride. And so this is going to help give us an understanding of, of what that Lord's chosen woman looks like. And that's who we want to be. This is who we want to be, right? <laughs> you can eat, you know, what came to my mind as soon as you were describing that, of course, it's right here in, in 2410, but we see something kind of similar when Jesus is born, we see men on camels you know basically going to his place of birth or at least where he was living at that time um and what do they bring him one of the, the things they bring him is gold they bring him gifts that is a um, good connection a yeah. good connection so we have this this parallel for the bride you know in a sense we have the birth of the bride in a sense and then we have the birth of the bridegroom and so um, both being sought after and brought gifts. That's so. a good connection. I had not made that. I had not made that connection. And sorry, I was looking down. I had to, somebody was saying, I can't get in. I can't get oh. in. So, so I was like, I text her the link again. Okay. So that's a really good connection. We got the camels and the gold, right? All right. Camel, camels and the gold. So, so as to go on a side note really quickly, to look at this servant, this uh, elusive servant, it's a picture of the Holy Spirit. Um, as a side note, the servant Eliezer is who everyone uh, assumes this servant is because uh, since he is the first unnamed but alluded to person in this narrative, there's two unnamed alluded to people in this narrative. So we've got him as this servant. Um, there is a servant mentioned by name once in Genesis 15, two, two and three. And it's when Abraham mentions Eliezer of some say Damascus it's only once and it's only time that's mentioned is when Abram before his name is changed with the breath of God Abram prays about and he's talking about who's going to inherit right. and the word Damascus there means silent is the sackcloth weaver okay so Eliezer of Damascus and we're trying I want you to make the connections with the Holy Spirit here um it's also Damascus is also known as an ancient trading capital but um, there's a sage, a Talmudic sage, his name's Chazal, <laughs> and he did a drosh on that expression, Eliezer of Damascus, and he says that's Dem Demasek, Eliezer, and that that means, I'm not understanding exactly, Dola Umashek, he's talking about the what this word means, but he says it means he drew as in drawing water and mm -hmm. gave to drink of his great rabbi's Torah or what Abraham, his rabbi understood, he was one who drew and gave to drink, which is ironic 
where we find him here in mm. this scenario, right? So mm. I was like, oh, that's worth that's worth noting that these rabbis were discussing the name Eleazar and what that Damascus could come from. Also, when we're searching for Isaac, uh, he's searching for Isaac's bride. He identifies himself the whole time as the servant. He presents himself as an extension of Abraham, right? Of Abraham's hand on behalf of Isaac humbly never never even speak in his name but he's presenting himself as this extension right and we see the holy spirit do the same thing the holy spirit we don't have a name for the holy spirit because who does he glorify he glorifies the son yeshua and who glorifies the lord you know and um the father so we see that same you know almost that same type of relationship here we don't know his name in a sense. 67 verses of chapter 24, he's interacting, but he remains anonymous. He, his name is never just, mentioned. Yeah. Humility, right? That's what you were, that's what yes. you were saying. Cause he so, was the second example of humility in here. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And then according to tradition, when Abram rescued Lot from the five Kings, um, the thir- 318 warriors that they mentioned, mm-hmm. The um, it alludes to Eliezer either being there or being the only person he needed because of this power. There's there there are you know midrashic tales of this this power that Eliezer had. Okay, so we're thinking of the power of the Holy Spirit because you know a lot of times there will be midrashic tales that may not have um uh they'll have a spiritual validity or a spiritual hint to them as opposed to a natural validity. So um because the 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 value of his name, Eliezer, is 318. So there was 318 oh. warriors, right? Okay. So they're saying it, that's alluding to that that battle and that conquest and Abraham being able to move in power. Eliezer is somehow mysteriously connected to that. So it's a, it's a picture of the spirit of God moving through Abraham's efforts there, right? Um, and he was the elder. He's it's uh, said he's the elder of Abraham's home. So he mentions that he's the Zikon. Well, that word implies, according to some, um, that he is the radiance of um, the radiant reflection of the master. Mm. And I was like, well, of course, that's it. So we see a lot of these different things about him. That's a picture of him reflecting him working on behalf of him expressing the Torah of Abraham, the father, right? So I think it's a beautiful picture that we're getting set up for here. And this is all the setup because w- as we move ahead, we're going to find this spirit, the spirit mm-hmm. of God working here and just, it's mm-hmm. going to bless us. It's going to bless us. Mm-hmm. You have anything else to say about that before I move on? Well, there's lots of parallels in here. <laughs> and I think that we'll start seeing more, even um, one of the things that, it, it, well, I don't know if, if you're going to go into verse 12, if you've already talked about that, but about when, <laughs> and this goes in with um, Adonai, the God of Abraham, my master, please make something happen before me today and show loyalty to Abraham, my master. And that loyalty is that has said, it's that covenant loyalty that he's talking about that we see the covenant between God and Abraham and um and then we see that he is falling back on that to say, remember your covenant with Abraham <clears throat> and and make something happen in kind of almost like I I read in one of the uh, commentaries I read was that he he's praying in a sense in Abraham's name, much like we would pray in good. Yeshua's name or in Jesus name. And what is it that we have with Yeshua? It's a covenant. So it's it's reminiscence of, again, that same covenant that God had with Abraham that he's bringing back up. And then when we pray in Jesus name, we're reminding God of the covenant we have with him. Oh, yeah, that's good. And you pointed out that word kindness is chesed, the mercy, right? Chesed, mm-hmm. right? right? That's good. That's good. Because it's that we're looking we're we're about to look at at mercy and truth. OK, mm-hmm. so at this village, well. Eliezer asked God for the son when the maiden. So he says, when the maidens come to the well, he's going to ask for a drink of water. And the woman who's going to offer to give not just him a drink, but also his camels is going to be the one destined for his master's son. Mm -hmm. One camel that has gone a few days 
without water can drink as much as um, 25 gallons of water. Mm -hmm. One camel, 25 gallons. So, and in contrast to that, the jars that were the typical water jar back Mm -hmm. then would usually hold no more than three gallons. So the jars that they carried were a pretty good sized jar, but it it would carry about three gallons. Okay. So, so when we start moving into this place, we're seeing that, that this woman is going to be a generous, a generous woman. Right. Mm -hmm. So as you just read, he prays, give me success. Mm -hmm. And then he says, behold, I'm standing. This is 13. Behold, I'm standing by the water fountain Mm -hmm. and the daughters of the people are coming out the water. And he says, now let this happen. Let this thing happen. So, um, let when he says, please let down your pitchers, your pitcher so that I can drink set. She'll say, drink and, and let me get your camels to drink. And by this, I'll know that you've shown that chesed, the kindness to my master. Mm-hmm. Who is it that the spirit is searching for here? And what are her beautiful attributes? Um, you know, we've mm-hmm. got a lot of pictures of the brides, you know, in our the bridezilla society now and what we imagine <laughs> the bride is going to look like and every wedding i'm going to a wedding tomorrow um every wedding typically is focused on the physical be- i mean people are getting their nails done their hair's done the eyelash right. extension the, the, but this is this is what our holy spirit is looking for in us the bride at a well mm-hmm. um jacob found rachel at a well Moses found Zipporah at a well. Mm-hmm. Tradition says that Abraham meets Keturah at the well of Beersheba, the mm. Sheba well. That's where Keturah dwelt. And, and there's also traditions that says Joseph met Asnoth, which was uh, in Egypt, mm. Asnoth, that he met her at a well. And, and there's, and, and Tamar uh, was met as well. And then, and then we had, yeah, Jesus at the well. And mm-hmm. so, so this is important here. And it's at Jacob's well too. So that's the this whole family we coming go. back. <laughs> here we go. Yeah. So this so. is a powerful thing that's about to speak to us here. And powerful. let me just bring up one more thing here. So if you, <laughs> in 13, like you already read, and the daughters of the men of the city are going out to draw water. So we see these women at the well. Well, in the story of Saul and Samuel, Saul meets Samuel, but what is, um, and if you're, if you want to check it out, you can write down just Samuel, first Samuel nine, and that's verse 11. And here's Saul and, um, he goes, and they went out up to the hill of the town and found some girls going out to draw water. So we see another situation like that where they met around, but here it was where Samuel and Saul are going to meet. And, and Saul's going to be anointed as king eventually. But we also see, we see several parallels between, um, sorry, Rebecca and Saul even, and the way that um, Eleanor sees and then how Samuel finds Saul. So it's very, very interesting that just the parallels in every story that we, we can see lots of them. So, but that's yeah. always intriguing to Beautiful. Me. Yes, yes, it is. So, Rebecca, the daughter of Abraham's nephew, Bethuel, appears at this well. Mm -hmm. So it says, and it happened before he finishes speaking, Mm -hmm. uh, that behold, Rebecca uh, shows up with a pitcher on her shoulder. Mm -hmm. So it's probably a max three-gallon pitcher. Mm -hmm. Now, the woman was very beautiful to behold. She's a virgin. No man had known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher. And she comes up. So she's a woman on her way. This, she doesn't have this man and his 10 camels on her books for the day, right? Right, right. Right? So she's she's doing her her business, and she's beautiful, mm-hmm. and she's a virgin. I just wanted to point out that in 2 Corinthians mm-hmm. uh, eleven two, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, right? Mm-hmm. It's us. We are, we are yeah. becoming, being presented as this chaste virgin, right? Like, like he's, Eliezer is, is looking for this virgin to present to his, his uh, master, Isaac. Mm-hmm. So, and the servant ran towards her and says, please let me have a sip of water from your pitcher. And of course, immediately what comes to mind is 
when you've got a woman at the well and someone mm-hmm. saying, please let me have a drink of water, it throws us back to John 4, 7. Right. Then comes the woman of Samaria to that well. And Jesus says to her, would you give me a drink? All right. So obviously that connection is ding, ding for yes. us. Mm-hmm. And Jesus says to her, if you knew the gift of God right. who and who it is, it's going to say to you, give me a drink. Mm-hmm. You would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Now we're supposed to have this living water that's flowing out of us, right? Mm-hmm. And then later on, he says, and this is going to be key with this, with these connections here. Later on, he says to her, the hour is coming and is now when the true worshipers are going to worship the father in spirit and in truth. For the father is seeking such to worship him. So we're seeing this seeking, right? right. God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. So let's keep that spirit and truth tucked in the back of our minds as we move through the rest of this. So she says, drink, my Lord. You know, she immediately takes that jug, drink, my Lord. She puts the pitcher down in her hand and she gives him a drink. So she's got this generous disposition Mm -hmm. and she's got this unselfish nature, right? Remember, it's not on her schedule, these 10 camels. And then after he gets that drink, she obviously sees all these camels. And she says, I'm going to draw water for your camels until they have finished drinking. In other words, right. I'm, I'm in, Mm -hmm. I'm fully into this, to this hospitality thing here. Mm -hmm. She's got this kind willingness to serve Mm -hmm. man and beast, Mm -hmm. a spontaneous benevolence. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's one, it's one thing to serve the man, but it's another thing to serve the beast, right? It's humility again. (laughs) It's a humility and it's a picture servant's heart. of the servant heart, because when we're dealing with humanity, we're not just dealing with the man. We're also dealing with the beast, okay. the flesh of man, which is not always easy to deal with right. when we're serving one another. We, right. There's a beast there, right? <laughs> right? That kind of snarly beast. <laughs> right? So, so 25 gallons mm. times, well, 25 gallons of water per Every stinky, weary, spitting, cranky, pushing to the front camel. If you've seen a group of camels before together trying to get to the water when they're thirsty, they act like people trying to get in line for uh, the Shabbat meal. (laughs) Sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. We have um, sheep and we have, um, so, you know, you put the beast come out. You walk (laughs) over with one thing of food that you're going to pour into um, a feed or, you know, and yeah. they're all pushing each other out of the way. So it brings they the all ugly want out it. hunger mm-hmm. and weariness brings the ugly out in, mm-hmm. in humanity as well as right. is the creatures. Definitely. But when we're serving as women who want to be the bride, sometimes we're serving the man and sometimes we're serving the weary spitting cranky yep. camel. Yes. So for every one of these camels, uh, there's 10 camels now. So that makes 250 gallons of water. Mm-hmm. And who knows how many gallons of beastly flesh, right? That she's about to deal with. Yes. That behavior. Three gallons at a time would take her 83.3 trips. Wow. So we got to buckle up, ladies, if we plan on, on impressing the spirit of the living God with their service to one another. That's a challenge. When I read that, when I was doing the math, I was like, he's my calculator. I was like, Oh Lord, we need the Holy spirit. If we're going to minister like this, yeah, we need the, Holy spirit. <laughs> the same thing when, um, when Abraham sent Sarah in and her servants to make his three visitors, um, the bread, the bread, mm-hmm. it yeah. was 80 loaves of bread they made, you know? So, um, that was a, that was, yeah, they don't do anything small in yes. the Middle East, right? They just, they, their, their heart is a servant heart to yes. make in abundance and do in abundance. For and he tells people. us to be generous without grumbling and complaining to each exactly. other, serve one another without grumbling and complaining. Mm-hmm. So I might, I could see maybe, you know, after like my 37th time back and forth to the well, while those camels are still spitting at me and snorting and, mm-hmm. and, and, but about about the 40th trip, I might start to say, I didn't, if I'd have known this, I'd have wore my muck boots, you know? Yes. (laughs) You know, start that mealy mouth in which that's that's not what she's doing here. 
Right. She quickly emptied her pitcher, her personal pitcher, into the trough. <laughs> it's a picture of what you're speaking about. And she runs back to the well to draw the water and starts drawing for those camels. And the man, the servant, wondering at her, remained silent. And that's the first mm-hmm. mention of that word. It's chirash uh, or harash. It means to plow, to devise, or to be silent. So the man is remaining silent and he's kind of ruminating too, yeah. watching her so as to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. So she's doing what he asked God to provide, but he's still got to find out if she is. So, so the spirit, okay, so picture the spirit watching us as we're serving, but he still has to wait to see. And that may be what's going on right now in the spiritual realm. The Holy Spirit may be watching the body and watching us serve one another, but he's still waiting for something, that confirmation from the Lord that we are part of that family, that our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that we are in that covenant relationship. So when the bride's identified by her hospitality and generosity and service, now he hasn't found out whether or not she's in the family yet. Mm-hmm. Rebecca is given gifts. Mm-hmm. So it was when the camels finished drinking, he doesn't ask her yet who she is as far mm-hmm. as her family line. He goes ahead and brings the nose ring and, and the um, bracelets. And this, these are gold. And then he says, first he gives her the, for the, uh, the jewelry. Then he says, whose daughter are you? I think that says a lot about the spirit right there. Whose daughter are you? He is adorning uh, her because he, he believes he knows who she is mm-hmm. by her, by her behavior long before she can cons- confirms it with her words right so I think and, that's what he's watching us for now yeah and I also think that I mean and it, it even says further out here that you know we know that God chose the bride just like he chooses us in house mm-hmm. chosen us from the beginning of time um he chose Rebecca and so I think the what I see going on here too is that it's all playing out for his I, Abraham's servant it's playing out and he's and he's prayed up he knows that he wants who God chooses and then he's just going to go and he's relying on the spirit of the Lord to guide yes. him and I think that it was it was almost like this flashing neon sign that said she's the one and then you see you know because you see the order he gives her the gold and then he asks so he's already assuming she's the one. And then he asks, whose daughter are you? And and I think that it's the same way, you know, that things play out in our own lives in a sense, because he's already chosen us. He's given us great things. Yeah. And, then, and then in a sense, he's asking, so whose daughter are you going to be? You know, and we make that choice Um, and in a sense that, you know, of course she had a father, but, but Abraham and Isaac were now, she was in this patriarch system, right? She's going to go in, she's going to leave her father's household and she's going to go into a new patriarch system where Abraham is now that head of the household. So she's allowing herself now to be taken into that. And, and in a sense, it's just, it, it's such a cool thing, I think, to see that whole thing played out because, and, and I guess even in the sense of it plays out with us in the sense that when we are prayed up and we were trying to do the Lord's will, then we, we go on like, oh, this looks like, this looks like what the Lord's doing here. I can see the Lord's hand in this. I can see him moving here and this is the path I'm to take and keep going. So I kind of see that kind of thing with the servant. I think he senses the Lord's will in this as well. Absolutely. Yes. Mm -hmm. He he says, whose daughter are you? Tell me, please. Mm -hmm. And she says, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, Milka's son, whom she Mm -hmm. bore to Nahor. So she's, she's in the family. And then she goes on to say, we have both straw and feed enough and room to lodge. Again, humility, hospitality. Mm -hmm. She's, she's not she's just been adorned with jewels and she's, she's continues to offer. She continues to offer. Right. Um, Eliezer sees she's from the land and the family that his master requires there. And those requirements that, that Abraham 
set forth in Genesis 24, seven. Mm -hmm. So then the man, the man, this is the, this is the picture of the spirit here bows down his head and worship the Lord. Mm -hmm. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of my master, Abraham, who has not forsaken his chesed. That's mercy. Mm -hmm. That's not the first mention of the word mercy, but it's important that word mercy, because what is the first mention of now is the word truth, mm. who is not forsaken his mercy and his truth. Mm -hmm. And that word there is going to be really important mm. from my master. As for me, the Lord led me on the road and that's to lead me is Derek or Derek to the house of my master's kinsman. So these words right here are about to explode in there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> in our scenario, because we're talking about mercy and truth that are here. And the Holy Spirit is speaking here to us mm -hmm. about as he's watching in that. I mean, this is an eager, this is an eager servant who is hungry to find that bride to satisfy his father, you know, Abraham for the son. This is a picture of us and what's important, the mercy and the truth to, and that's what led him on that Derek. So I want to sit and spin. Remember that when, uh, I don't know if that was mm -hmm. out when you were a kid, mm -hmm. there was something called a sit and spin. I want to sit and spin with this verse 27 for a little bit. Okay. What is it that we need to see in order to be led on that road, that Derek as that loyal servant in the fullness of truth. This is big because that's a part of our destiny as children of the King, as well as being guided by the spirit. And this is going to help us understand how to walk, um, uh, through the, through the next days until we, uh, um, have watered all those camels. <laughs> so Genesis, um, 24, 27 here, uh, adds, puts together that, uh, Spirit, that not spirit and truth, but um, mercy and truth and the word Derek. If you look at Psalms 145, 17 and 18, this is what it says. The Lord is righteous in all his ways. And that's the word Derek, path, journey. The Lord is righteous in all his Derek and kind in all his deeds, right? Chesed. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. And that's what we just watched. This is what we just watched Eliezer do. Right. Okay. Right. <laughs> so that word truth there, emet in Hebrew, it's spelled Aleph, Mem, Tav. And the first mention is always the most important. So that Aleph, Mem, Tav is mysteriously, exquisitely significant <laughs> here. And I'm going to try to see if I can, it, it is to me. So I'm going to see if I can share this with you. So Aleph is the first letter of the alphabet. So it starts with the Aleph and Tav is the last letter of the alphabet. You probably know where I'm going here, right? Mm -hmm. Because we know yeah. that the Mem is the very middle letter of the alphabet. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the Aleph being the first letter is a picture of that ox or the head mm -hmm. and it's the leader. Abba, the father, right? Mm -hmm. Aleph. And then the middle letter is the mem, which is a picture of the moving water. Right. And then the tav being the last letter is a pictograph of the cross. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and even the, the name Aleph is the word for, Aleph is the word for Lord, or Aleph is the word for master. Mm -hmm. So we've got the Aleph mem tav. Some say that truth points to that this word, what this word is saying is that the word truth is telling us through this progression, Aleph Mem Tav, first of the alphabet, middle of the alphabet, end of the alphabet, that there's the progression in understanding from Aleph to Bet to Gimel to Dalit, right? As we move from, from one truth to another, that's how we're moving through life, grabbing a hold of these truths. That's the, that's the epitome of truth, learning the word of God, the Torah. Well, truth has that Aleph Mem Tav, we look at Revelation 21, 6 and 7, and this is what the words of our 
our Isaac, our waiting bridegroom, says, it is done. I am the Aleph and the Toph, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Mm -hmm. He who overcomes will inherit all things and I will be his God and he will be my son. Right? Mm. This is the word truth that we just found in this story and it is overflowing with water. There's water everywhere. Right. There it's is. Feeding that beastie camel and all. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And the bride is participating with the water. Mm -hmm. That's us with rivers of living water flowing out of us. Right. 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 Water is essential for life and Jesus is essential for life. I mean, without. Amen. Without water, there would be no life. And so, um, and there's so many parallels again, and that's just my favorite thing in scripture, the parallels, but, but, you know, you can go back to the garden of Eden and the four rivers and, and then all the way to revelation and the river that comes, you know, and flows and, and he's the river of life. He's the, he's the tree of life in the garden. He's the river of life in, in revelation, revelation, sorry. And Ezekiel, you know, so um, it's just a beautiful picture of that pattern being repeated over and over. And like you said, like, you know, we talked about a little bit ago, the whole well, coming to the well and um and what do you do at a well you gather water but your thirst is quenched and he is that well so. he is he is and there's a picture of truth here that's connected with that mm -hmm. i am right. the aleph and the tav and he's mm -hmm. going to give those fountains so that's the aleph mem tav that right. he's right. he's speaking of truth here so when truth appears it follows mercy that's what the first time that we find it in scripture, truth mm -hmm. follows mercy, mm -hmm. which is also what you pointed out earlier. This whole, this whole thing has a, has just an undercurrent of humility mm -hmm. moving through it. Yeah. Truth, when it appears, it follows mercy. Mm -hmm. Here's a couple. If you start, if you go and you look up truth and mercy, you'll find truth following mercy throughout the scriptures. Psalms and 85. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Go ahead. Psalms 85, mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and mm -hmm. peace have kissed each other. Mm, I love that verse. All the paths, this is Psalms 25, 10. All the paths of the Lord are, now we we're talking about Derek. All the paths of the Lord are mm. mercy and truth. And mm. to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. And then, so we've got there the Derek and the Hesed and the, the uh, Emmet, the truth. Psalms 26, three, for your mercy is before my eyes and I have walked in your truth. Again, let's picture the path, right? Psalms 40, 11, you, O Lord, will not withhold your compassion from me, lest your mercy and your truth continually preserve me. And the last one, Psalm 69, 13, but as for me, let my prayer be unto you, O Lord, in an acceptable time, O God. And this is a picture of Eliezer praying. In the abundance of thy mercy, answer me with the truth of your Yeshua. Mm -hmm. So this is all a picture of this Torah portion. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's <laughs> yeah, good. isn't it? Beautiful. And, and the little bit of deeper meaning than mercy even is that covenant loyalty, because that's, that is why God does what he does. I mean, it's because, and it, it goes to David. I mean, it, it you know, when, when he tells us, when he, when David is described as a heart, a man after God's heart, it's actually, um, that David has a heart like God's, he has a covenant loyal heart like God's. And that's what made him special. And I think that that's, that is what's emphasized, um, mm -hmm. this loyalty because, because he goes back the servant sees that covenant loyalty in Abraham that God has for Abraham and Abraham has for God. And, and so, and that yeah. is what it's at the bottom, or I don't want to say bottom, but at the, the foundation of marriage, right? It's, it's yes. that covenant. So yes. we make the covenant with our savior. We were in covenant with him, but we're in covenant in marriage. So it's, yes. it's, it's marriage is the picture of everything that the father and the son are doing on our behalf and the, the, the relationship they're drawing us into. 
is just like what they want us to experience in marriage. And, um, you know, so it, it is, it's Beautiful. just, it all is so connected. And, and I love, I just love the term covenant loyalty, because I think that it's, it's a deeper word than even mercy or loving kindness yeah. can really explain. I mean, those are words that are commonly used, but when you really think of it, that he is so loyal to yeah. us. And when we see these covenants happen, and this has been a big subject that I've loved to study recently, but when he makes the covenant with Noah, which way is this bow? This And it's it's not just a rainbow like we might think, but it's a bow, like a bow and arrow. And which way is the business side facing? It's facing the heavens. It's facing God's throne in a sense. Who walks through the blood of with the covenant with Abraham? It's not Abraham. It's the father. It's Jesus in a sense that he walks and says, it will be my blood when you break covenant. It will be my blood. And so we see this, here's another example of covenant, of the covenant loyalty and, and regardly, um, re regarding to marriage now. So it's just a beautiful picture that's sown throughout scripture. It is. And that whole, the heart, the heart of David in covenant we're seeing here mm -hmm. for Eliezer, when he makes that oath with exactly. Abraham, he's walking in that same covenant that you're speaking about there, that covenant loyalty. We're watching that being played out with Eliezer here mm -hmm. and we'll watch it as well you know and um their little Re uh, rebecca has already she has the makings of covenant loyalty because even before she's entered into the covenant we see her being um being true to her word and being true to um to her convictions to serve and being to having that that's the capacity that that um, linking to that covenant loyalty that you're talking about in order for us to be that bride and enter into that covenant mm -hmm. that he's inviting us into. He's looking for that Rebecca spirit in us that we are that type of girl who's willing right. to go that stinky service distance to that mm -hmm. nth degree, because that is what covenant loyalty does. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, you know, it's uh Yeshua entered into the covenant with us to the death, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's that covenant. And so that's what he's looking for in, in us. And that's what he finds there in Rebecca. So, and so you Ella, see, as, go ahead. as we move through this chapter, you see the opposite happening with um, Laban, actually, because yeah. when, when he comes to Laban's household and who who actually unloads the camel and who gives the straw in the feet and who washes the feet of the men who are with him it's eleazar it's not laban there's no oh. covenant <laughs> loyalty there there's Ooh. no kindness and that humility there he he's a kind of like gets to the chase like hey how much you giving us for right. this woman? you know like like let's really get yeah. down to the facts here you know we want right. to know he's um, getting all like whoo you look yeah. like a <laughs> yeah so there's no and and you even see it in the wording so when so so we see like we we start out with seeing Elena Eliezer sorry um praying to the Lord there in the very beginning and then he tells the story to Rebecca but when he tells the story to Laban he leaves out loyalty he leaves out that covenant loyalty mm. um he, before he's told, go to my relatives and find a wife. But then he tells Laban um, that he was told there in 38, you must go to my father's house and to my family and take. So he, so he changes the wording a little bit, not to be deceitful, but because he deal, he knows right away of how he's treated when he gets to Laban's, that he's not dealing with the same kind of man that Abraham is nor even the same kind of person that Rebecca is. He's dealing with a different, different kind of person. And yeah. that's significant because he treats him then differently. And that's the, way the discerning treated. spirit yeah. that we have to have. Too, right? Yes. Yeah. But we see the opposite. Now we see that anti humility, that, that proud spirit of, of Laban. And, and again, and I think this is foreshadowing, right? Because we see this story we see Laban enter into the story with Jacob and we see that lying spirit and that, that 
deceitful thing going on that is the opposite you know of of jacob's family so not that there weren't some issues obviously but but i i think that that's kind of foreshadowing what we'll see later so, so when eliezer meets the family um, you know, I was reminded to Song of Songs, like mm -hmm. a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. You know, here you've got Rebecca, and she's like a lily among the thorns here. And one might ask, what does Labor Laban represent? If we have a picture here of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the Bride, what does Laban represent? You know, my husband asked me that this uh, this morning when we were talking, he was like, well, what does Laban, what do you think he represents? And I said, you know, perhaps the fallen world, the world that wants to get its grubby little fingers on everything it can. Um, you know, the world that the Lord wants to take us out of, you know, come, come away with me out into the desert, my love, you know? Mm. Um, so we find in uh, verse 28, the young woman goes and she tells her mama, right. Um, and, uh, she, and then it says, she goes and tells her mother. Now, Rebecca has a brother whose name is Laban, and he goes out to the man by the well because um, he saw the nose ring and the bracelets, you know. He's like, okay, what's going on here? And when he hears the words of his sister, Rebecca, he's, she's saying, well, this is what the man told me. Then he goes and uh, says, you know, come in and be blessed, blessed to the Lord. Uh, and he uses the name Yahweh there. Uh, you know, why stand outside? I've prepared the house and a place for the camels. And then the man comes into the house and he unloads the camels and provides straw and feed for the camels and water to wash the feet and the feet of the men who are with him. So Eliezer is invited into their home where he's going to repeat the story of the this, these events. Um, they've set out the food. He's not going to eat until he finds, gets the answer from them. Um, so he goes on and he says, again, I'm Abraham's servant. He doesn't say, this is my name. These are my credentials. He's like, I'm an extension of the, of the arm of Abraham. And the, and he, and he, and he elevates Abraham. The Lord has blessed my master greatly. You know, he's talking about God, what God has done. So he's lifting up the name of God. Yahweh has blessed my master greatly and he has become great. Mm -hmm. Um, and and he's given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and male and female and camels and donkeys. In other words, the, the focus is all on the Lord and what he's done for Abraham. And then he goes on to speak of the son who, who has all that the father has. Um, so then he goes on and, and tells the story in, in a, diff, a different verbiage. Again, like you said, he knows who he's dealing with and he's repeating, reiterating. Mm -hmm. Um, before I finish speaking in my heart, he tells them, you know, here, she, you know, Rachel comes out, I'm praying this and Rachel comes out with a pitcher on her shoulders. And then he says, he, he tells them, then I kneeled and prostrated myself to the Lord. And I blessed the Lord, the God of my master, Abraham, who led me on the Derek. So he, again, he's, we're finding this reiterated for us mm -hmm. in the scripture. The Lord, the God of my master, Abraham, led me on this true path, the true path to take that daughter of my master's brother for his son. Now, if you will do kindness, now, if you will do that, that chesed and truth. Now, if you will do chesed and truth with my master, tell me. And if not, tell me, and I'm going to return, uh, I'll turn to the right or the left. I'll go, I'll go on, but you're going to tell me if you're going to do kindness and truth to me by allowing me to take this bride with me. So we're finding kindness and truth throughout this scripture, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Over and over. And it's big and it's connected to us worshiping in spirit and truth. It's connected to the flow of that living water within us. It's connected to us being able to walk on that path. It's connected to us being able to be, to be uh, a bride that is humble enough and uh, readying ourselves enough to enter into that covenant um, and uh, exercise in that place of humility, mm -hmm. uh, what the Lord requires. Uh, I've, I've stuck this in here 
uh, I made reference to it earlier, Psalms 85. And I think this should be um, a prayer for us. Mm -hmm. 6 to 13. Will you not revive us again? That your people may rejoice in you, you know? And the reason that this was, uh, when I found this scripture that had mercy and truth in it, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, there's a, there's a song I like to listen to that talks about find your zeal for the Lord. And I've been talking to the Lord a lot lately, or rather he's been talking to me a lot lately about stirring up the spirit within us. We want, we want that living water to be flowing out of us. We want to be able to water those stinky, cranky camels with a smile on our face mm -hmm. and with mercy in our heart because we're filled with the truth and this water is flowing out of us. And so that's why I was like, oh, we need this as a prayer. So I thought I just stuck it right here, stuck it right here in the middle. I was like, we just need to pray this right here in the middle of this. Uh, will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your hesed, O Lord, and grant us your Yeshua. Grant us your salvation. Mm -hmm. I will hear what the God, what God, the Lord will speak for. He will speak peace to his people and to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Surely his Yeshua is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. Mm -hmm. Yes, the Lord will give what is good and our land will yield its increase Righteousness will go before him and will make his footsteps, his footsteps, our pathway. So I'm praying this, Heavenly Father, for us. I'm asking, Lord, that, that you would make this scripture stir up through this Torah portion, stir up in us, because we want to hear what you're saying. And we want to walk in those footsteps that are we want our pathway to be your pathways and we want it to be this mercy and truth um, because uh, mercy and truth have met together and righteousness and peace have kissed that's intimate he's he's speaking here this is this is a um i think that these psalms are uh are romance it's 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 the it's the god of the universe sending through the spirit words of of yearning to our hearts as the bride, as the bride. Mm. Um, because in this, in this scripture, this is, this is a romantic, romantic scripture. All of this tour portion is so romantic. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> so the bride, when the bride is agreed to, Rebecca is given more gifts. And so um, here is Rebecca before you. Take her and go and let her be your master's son's wife as the Lord has spoken. That's what they say. And it came to pass when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshiped the Lord, bowing himself to the earth. And then he brings out more, he brings out jewelry, silver and gold, clothing and gave them to Rebecca. And he also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. And she returns with Eliezer to the land of Canaan. The Holy Spirit has gifts for us to prepare us to meet our groom. That's right. And I want to be, I want to be adorned mm -hmm. and we need it. We need those beautiful, that beautification that only the Holy Spirit can give us to make us um, perfectly uh, prepared for our groom. So she returns with Eliezer to the land of Canaan. And so it says here, and this is another thing I found interesting. So they sent away Rebecca, their sister and her nurse. And Abraham's servant and his men. So it mentions the nurse with Abraham's servant. Mm -hmm. Both of these, both of these are alluded to characters, but their their names are not given. So that's this is our second side note on the one that this um, the ambiguity surrounding this nurse that she's alluded to here. So I wanted to do a little quick side note over on on Deborah uh, because when Sarah dies. And Rebecca arrives with her anonymous nurse. It's it's Genesis 24, 59. But three portions later in uh, Vayishlach, which is and he sent, um, that's the only place, just like Eliezer, is only mentioned one time. And it's way outside of this story. 
uh, this nurse, Deborah, is only mentioned one time uh, at the death and burial. Um, she's her her death and burial is mentioned. Um, oddly, this happens in the middle of the narrative of Jacob's return to Bethel. So it's like when we're reading in Vayishlach, uh, where Jacob is going to Bethel and he builds an altar there and he calls the place El Bethel and God appears to him. It says, because there God appeared to him when he was fleeing from his brother. And it's like, we see that. And then all of a sudden inserted in that. Now, Deborah, Rebecca's nurse died and she was buried below Bethel under the terebinth tree mm. or the Oak of Weeping, right? So it was called the um, Alon Bakuth. So they, this is just sandwiched in there. And then it goes right back to the narrative. Then God appeared to Jacob again. So it's like, he's there at this place where God appeared to him. And there's the narrative. I mean, there's the insert of this mm -hmm. mysterious nurse. And um, then God appeared to Jacob and blessed him and said, your name is Jacob. Uh, uh, now it's, uh, is Israel is your new name. So he called it. So he's getting his name changed in right in the middle of that narrative. You know, and the Lord does these beautiful little, you know, he's such a, the way he whispers to us in the, in the Torah is, is fascinating to me. So he's, her name is sandwiched in between there. And mm -hmm. so that's who we believe this Deborah is this. And, and so, so I'm going to go ahead and ask you, what do you think? What do you think? I'm, what's your hypothesis on that? Why do you think, um, who do you think this person represents Deborah? This nurse, this, that's going to go accompany her. Hmm. Well, hmm, that's a good question because the first thing that, that kind of comes to my mind is how it talks about the Torah being our tutor mm -hmm. and, um, our, you know, and I think of in my own life, a mentor who, who went, who walked next to me, beside me on this journey of, of learning more about Yeshua. So in a sense, I, maybe, maybe it's, it's, the Torah, the, the law, the, you know, yeah. Word of God in a sense, um, teaching yeah. her because my, my, um, I have the Messianic Jewish family Bible and it calls her a nanny. So mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting, but yeah. Well, and, and the fact that Deborah, this nurse tradition says that Rebecca, when Jacob leaves, to go back to Laban, she sends Deborah to to watch over him, and he's the one who is who's there, taking care of as Rachel and Leah are in their battles and raising children and all that. She is a presence there mm -hmm. because when she comes back, that's they're moving, they're coming back to this area, and so tradition says she was there all along, like she's made that she made that whole loop, she made the loop coming out with Rebecca. And then she made the loop going back to Laban. Mm -hmm. um, which, so it's like, there's a picture of, and, and I think it's, that's right on the money. As far as I'm concerned, I don't really know. I'm just, both of these Eliezer and Deborah are these un, unmentioned presences mm -hmm. here. And I believe that they are somehow a, a, a broken apart, perhaps picture of the word of God moving in spirit, right? That spirit mm -hmm. and truth, you know, um, that because we have male feminine expressions of, um, right. Right. of, of all, of all things Torah. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought that was pretty mm -hmm. interesting that we've got this, it's all talking about the spirit and we're seeing this right. water moving. We're seeing this, we're seeing truth and mercy and we're seeing, um, all this prof these prophetic pictures and this has to apply to us mm -hmm. this this nurse this um because the picture of the spirit is that a communicator and that uh, like you said a nanny you know the lord is like watching over our steps and mm -hmm. and speaking in our ear and guiding us quietly and so mm -hmm. so yeah I, I just thought and that was notable yeah it's very beautiful and that in the comments um Ruth says um, spiritual midwives represent the intercessors of today. And, and I, that's a really good. That's very good. good thought yeah. Too. yeah. Yeah. And, you know, is that a picture of that, of that prayer? I mean, of that, of that, um, 
you know, that communicating mm -hmm. uh, prayer uh, that's going to go along that intercessor that's going to, yeah. I right. mean, there's, we have not just gold and, and, um, and jewelry and adornments in that way. The spirit gives us, um, and, and I think that what we find through Eleazar, the picture of Eleazar and, and, and uh, Deborah together here, um, and I, I kind of felt like I went to sleep praying about this tour portion mm -hmm. and I woke up kind of having this conversation with God and I felt like he was, you know, how sometimes you feel like he's saying something. And I, I felt like I was impressed upon me that we have pictures that we see um, so that we kind of get an understanding of who God the father is. And we have obviously, you know, the Messiah came and we have a, we have kind of an understanding of the, of the personality of, and the nature of, of Yeshua. As Jesus walked, we can read his words and watch his patterns of behavior. And so we've got a pretty good idea of who the father and the son is, but when it comes to the Holy spirit, um, it's very silent. Mo most of the time that what we find is, you know, the Holy spirit comes upon Saul and he prophesies or the Holy spirit falls upon, you know, Samson or, or right. the Holy spirit moves and, and he, you know, somebody's pulling out a jawbone of a, of a donkey and killing all these people. And, and the Holy spirit's moving and, and, and guiding and stuff. But I, I believe that in this, this tour portion here, we're getting a, a look at the uh, character and personhood more of a, more of a, a ballpark understanding of that mm. personality of the Holy Spirit through this Eliezer who is seeking and, and honoring and, mm. and adorning. And, but we're, but we're, it's almost like when we're watching Jesus walk, we're able to watch the Holy Spirit in, in a picturesque way here, an allegory through Eliezer. And so I think Deborah's kind of like a, a hint that's wound into that. Yes. Just saying. <laughs> <laughs> that's very what pretty. i think the lord very was good. saying to me yeah so let's see how are we doing on time oh it's 107 yeah, we're a little over so. yeah so we probably need to wrap it up right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay anything else Thank you want to add at the last the i mean no. we didn't get through the rest of it but we got through some good stuff we got through most of the good stuff mm -hmm. <laughs> that i had yeah i had a few things but we're good we're yeah good. yeah don't, i don't want to go too long right so. right well how do you normally um well, we normally... usually we can um, pray if if um, one of us want to pray. Well, you prayed, so maybe I can pray. Yes, and then you we should in the recording, Absolutely. and then we'll do the what they call the after party. So yes, so let's pray, dear Heavenly Father. Thank you, Lord, for this picture of your Holy Spirit, as Deborah beautifully showed us. And so I just thank you for who you are and and how you have chosen us as your bride just as you chose Rebecca for Isaac's mm -hmm. bride. Mm -hmm. And Father, we just thank you for your son, for Yeshua being our living water. And that we, and all, all these words are just flooding my mind with spirit and with truth. And mm -hmm. we serve you, we worship you in spirit and truth. And thank you, Father, that that the New Testament is is a commentary on the old, and we can see those parallels, and and they're not by accident. It's to help us see you better and help us to know Yeshua better yes. and to love him more. So I just, I ask that you be with all these women here today and those who couldn't make it, and I just pray, Lord, for blessings over them, for their families, their children, Um I just pray, Father, that you would bring healing into their lives and into the lives of their children and their husbands. So, Father, we just thank you. We praise you. And we ask that you fill us and you just help us to love one another as you love us. In the name yes. of Yeshua. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.